All right, we're astronomers. We're studying the stars. Um, we know now how to measure the, the distance and temperature and luminosity and all these things about the stars. So what do we do next? You go out and you measure it for this star, and you measure it for that star, and you measure it for another star. So how does science work? Well, in science, we observe the world around us mathematically, if at all possible, and then we look for patterns. And then when we see those patterns, we try to come up with theories, hypotheses to explain these patterns, and then we rigorously put our hypotheses to the test, and that's how the things go forward. So now we're looking for patterns. Patterns in the stars. So we can measure these basic fundamental quantities of the star the stars. So we can measure things like the luminosity luminosity of stars, and we can measure the temperature of stars. Temperature of stars. Uh, these are fundamental quantities. Luminosity, total amount of light energy from a star flowing out into space. Temperature, surface temperature of a star. Okay, so we can do this by spectral type. And so, about a hundred years ago, a little more than a hundred years ago, um, two different astronomers independently came up on the same way of looking for this. So, I mean, we can measure the luminosity, we measure the temperature, great, wonderful, glorious, and then so we get columns of numbers. And the human mind is not very good at seeing patterns in columns of numbers. You do this for 10,000 stars and then you stare at them and it's like, is there a pattern to this? No. What you do is you make a plot. And you make a graph of this. The human eye is great at seeing graphical patterns. So uh, two different astronomers came up with this, basically independent of each other, Enyar Hertzsprung and uh, Henry Norris Russell. So this is called a Hertzsprung, Hertzsprung, Russell diagram, often abbreviated as an HR diagram. And they found out that when they plotted out luminosity and temperature, they learned some really interesting things. So let's see, on the horizontal axis, we plot temperature. Now, normally you'd think you'd go from zero up from there, from cool to hot. Well, again, they were looking at spectral types. They, they didn't realize this was temperature when they first did it. So we put hot on the left. O, B, A, F, G, K, and M. So here's hot, and here's cool. Cooler. I mean, all stars are hot. You can get burned up going into any kind of star. But type M stars are the coolest stars that we can see, sort of thing like that. And then luminosity goes up and down. So here's, here's luminosity, and so here's stars that are, you know, low luminosity and stars that are high luminosity. Luminosity varies fantastically from star. There are some stars with, you know, 0.001% or a tiny fraction of the sun's luminosity, and then there are stars that are a thousand times the luminosity of the sun. So luminosity varies enormously. And so in order to put this, we've got to do kind of a kind of a logarithmic scale here. So here's like, you know, here's 0.01 suns and 0.1 suns and 1 sun and 10 suns and 100 suns and 1,000 suns. And in terms of luminosity, in order to get anything there so that it's not all squashed at the bottom. Uh, and then temperature runs on this scale. And so every dot on this plot represents one star. One star represents one dot on the plot. So if you've got a star which is very luminous but cool, you put it up here. If you've got a star which is very luminous but hot, you put it here. If you get a star with low luminous but cool, it's over here. You've got a star that's not very luminous but hot, you put it over here. And when people started plotting out all this sort of thing about where all these stars went, they found that the vast majority of stars lie in a band on this plot kind of a curving, sort of a band, sort of thing like this. And this band they called the main sequence. Somewhere, it depends on which group of stars we're looking at, roughly 95% of stars. 95% of stars, particularly stars in the sky, just in this neighborhood, our neck of the woods, this part of the galaxy, roughly 95% of stars fall in the main sequence. There were other places where stars were found as well. There were, they found that there was a group of stars that are not luminous at all, have tiny, tiny, tiny luminous luminosities, but are extraordinarily hot. They're so hot that they glow white, and since their luminosities are small, that, that must be really small stars. If these stars had the same amount of super surface area as our sun, with that temperature, that enormous temperature, they're putting out huge luminosities. So luminosity and temperature also tell us something about how big the star is. If a star is hot, but it's low luminosity, it must be small. So these are small stars, so we call them white dwarf stars. And then what did we find? We found other stars where, you know, so along the main sequence, 
the the hottest stars are really luminous and the coolest stars are not very luminous kind of a little bit of a logical pattern there uh, but they found that there was a group of stars who were cool but very luminous so they're off over here they're very luminous they're cool so these are the red giants these stars are cool so by Wien's law if you're a cool star your peak wavelength is going to be at a long wavelength sort of thing like that uh, it's got a peak off there so that's going to be red in color red is the longest wavelength the human eye can see uh, but these are putting out huge thousands of times more light than the Sun does so these stars must have be very large have a huge surface area to do that they're red giant stars and they also found that there was a group of these these huge kind of super giant stars up here super giant stars up here where they could have any temperature you want and they're just colossal just absolutely enormous luminosity 10,000 times the luminosity of the Sun um, very rare stars but you can see them from really far away so they're there that, that's what we're talking about and so we plot out the HR diagram and then we say why how come what makes this take place what explains this? And this is the process of science. This is how all science works. We observe the world around us, mathematically impossible. We find patterns in what we observe, and then we try to come up with theories to explain this. What makes most stars be on this very narrow region of the HR diagram? What puts a few stars down here and up here, and uh, have even fewer more of stars up there? So in order to do that, we need, to, we need more measurements. We need more measurements of stars, and we need to understand how the stars work, and how the stars shine. Uh, one thing we're going to have to do is measure the mass of a star. Mass of stars. How do you measure the mass of a star? How do you measure the mass of anything? In astronomy, here's how we measure mass. We measure masses based on orbits. That's how we do it. Uh, if you've you know, got an object, then based on the speed of the orbits, well, Newton's version of Kepler's third law, laws of gravity and motion. If it's orbiting really fast, there must be a strong force of gravity holding onto it. If it's orbiting more slowly at the same distance, well, then it must, the force of gravity must not be as strong, so the mass is not as strong. So, in order to measure mass of stars from orbits, what's orbit around stars? Well, there are planets that orbit around stars, but we've only found those recently. Um, traditionally, what we do is we look for two stars orbiting around each other, which is actually very common. Um, our sun is a loner. It's all by itself. Our sun, and it has some planets, and that's it. But at least, you know, I don't know, somewhere at least half the, the stars in the sky are part of at least binary or sometimes even trinary star systems. Lots of stars are, exist in pairs. We have two stars orbiting around each other. Orbits of binary stars. So we can do this, and we can either see them moving around each other, or sometimes we can do it through the Doppler effect. You know, they're very close to each other. We can't distinguish them with the telescope, but this one moves towards us, this one moves away from us, so we see how its spectral lines shift back and forth, and it's like, aha, this is actually two stars. And then we can calculate based on the amount, how, what percentage of the mass is in this star, what percentage of the mass is in that star, and based on the orbital period and the, the orbital distance, we can then calculate masses. And we find that the mass of the stars explains quite a bit, actually, that uh, when we look at the mass of the stars, again, okay, we'll quick sketch up the HR diagram. Here's temperature going from hot to cool. Here's luminosity going from faint to bright. Here's the main sequence there. And we find that along the main sequence, location on the main sequence is all about mass. Our sun is on the main sequence. Our sun is, I don't know, about a third of the way up the main sequence. So here's, here's one solar luminosity. Here's 5,800 Kelvin. Remember, this is surface temperature we're looking at. And then we find that if a star is down here, it's less massive than the sun. And if a star is up here, it's more massive. So this is less massive. And then these, so these stars that are cool and faint, these red dwarf stars, these lower main sequence stars, these are less massive than our sun. On the other hand, these stars, these big stars, these hot, bright, intense stars way up here, these upper main sequence stars, these O and B type stars, very massive, hot blue stars putting huge amounts of light energy out into space, these have more mass. We find that the masses of stars varies considerably, that the most massive stars have mm, somewhere around 100 times the mass of the sun, and that the less massive stars, you go down to still be a star, but, you know, it goes down somewhere around one-tenth, about 0.1 solar masses and then it varies considerably along this so so your main sequence is a sequence in mass 
So O, B, A, F, G, K, M runs along here, and your type M stars are your least, type M main sequence stars are the least massive, massive. Your type O main sequence stars are more massive, and so that's interesting. Somehow mass is controlling the luminosity of a star. Because remember, stars all have the same chemical composition. About, you know, they're all about 70% hydrogen, about 30% helium, one or two or three percent other stuff. Uh, but this, this is this is interesting. There, you know, the, the the mass ranges along that from from one side to the other, and and so 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 mass controls what a star is going to be, what what, what it's going to do, what what luminosity it will have. So why do we? Why does mass do that? Well, this comes back to our theory of what's going on inside the stars. Um, so here's a theory to explain why stars have different luminosities. Theory to explain why stars have different luminosities is they're doing nuclear fusion in their cores at different rates. Theory, nuclear fusion, fusion, hydrogen to helium in the star's cores. I mean, we talked about that going on with the sun. We can, we can actually measure those neutrinos coming off of the, from the, the core of the sun, verifying that there really is nuclear fusion going on in the sun at the right rate that we've predicted. And then we take that theory and now we apply it to the stars. And this is beautiful. This is one thing. So the main sequence is discovered, you know, I don't know, in 19, 1900, 1910, somewhere around in there where it's really discovered, figured out. And so at first, nobody has any clue. Nobody has, at that point, people, you know, nuclear physics hadn't been invented yet. People are just figuring it out. And then, in the 1930s and 40s, well, people get interested in nuclear physics for a wide variety of reasons. And one of the first things people do once they're done with that is they apply their nuclear physics equations to stars. And when they applied their nuclear physics equations to stars, and they said, okay, if stars are a big ball of 70% hydrogen, 30% helium, and they have different masses, and they are doing nuclear fusion inside, and so you take the equations of nuclear fusion, and you take the equations of gravity, and you take the equations of heat energy and heat flow, and then you calculate on a computer, theoretically, well, if all these ideas are correct, and that all stars have the same chemical composition, and this is the fundamental process going on inside the stars, what would their what would their surface temperatures and luminosities be? And one of the great triumphs of 20th century science is when they did all these comp computations and those very early punch card computers, and they were able to theoretically predict the main sequence. When they said, "All right, if stars, you know, here's the mass star with two solar masses, and put in the equations of nuclear fusion and gravity and heat energy and all this sort of thing, and you calculate, well, what surface temperatures should it have and what luminosity should it have?" bang, it's exactly what we actually really do observe on the main sequence. And then you put in different masses and you can theoretically reproduce the main sequence from nothing but just some basic physics equations and assuming you have different masses, then you reproduce this curve of the main sequence just beautifully. It's awesome. It's wonderful. It is a great triumph. And this is, this is how we know that the main sequence stars are doing hydrogen to helium fusion in their cores. We can't see that. We cannot look inside to the core of a star and actually know that. We, we can really only get neutrinos from our own sun. But because the distribution of luminosities and temperatures match exactly what the theoretical equations predict what would happen if they were doing hydrogen to helium fusion in their cores, then we know, aha, this can't be a coincidence. The numbers match up beautifully with mass and temperature and luminosity. They just click. What we see with our telescopes is exactly what we see theoretically coming out of our computers and our math and our equations. And so therefore we know. That's how we really know that there is nuclear fusion going on in the cores of these main sequence stars turning hydrogen into helium. And so then we know something. We know why the stars shine.